Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. It's so great to see you all here. You will hear me hopefully when the noise stops in the room. Can everybody hear me now? Great. So wonderful to see and be with, be with you all again. My name is Anna Barker and welcome to everybody online as well. Everybody on Zoom. We have this wonderful group of people who are online. Um, today is April 4th, April 4th, 2023. I'm Anna Barker. <laughs> And somebody said to me the other day, are you counting? And I said, no, I'm not counting. But as it turns out, 12 is the number. So I am counting, apparently. Well, what a week we've had. We've had an incredible week. NCAA, what a, what a week that has been. Who went to the ballet here? Unbelievable performance. Just breathtaking. Uh, we were featured in the opinion page of the Herald Times on Sunday. Thank you very much to Jim Bright for making that possible. Yeah. Uh, Habitat Build, we were at, with Habitat this week, which uh, thematically this week feels like a really good thing. And there's so much to celebrate. At the same time, we're surrounded by pain and anguish in nearby, nearby communities that were battered by the Friday night storm. And we'll be talking about that a little later in the, in the program. So April, and this sort of brings it all together, is Environment Month at Rotary International, which is now deeply committed to activities that strengthen the conservation and protection of our natural resources, advances ecological sustainability, and fosters harmony between communities and the environment. The adoption of this theme has led to an expanding number of programs around the world, some of which are funded by your contributions to Rotary International. We're going to have a quick look at a video here of a, of a program that, is, um, that represents a lot of what's happening now around. Hi, I'm Emily Stevenson, co-founder of Beach Guardian down in the southwest of England. I'm currently on Travone Beach in North Cornwall and I've just done a beach clean and found all of this plastic that's washed in on the tide onto the beach. In 2019, I was delighted to be recognized by the Rotary Young Citizen Award. I love working with Rotary to help support and protect our environment and every time I do work with Rotary they're always so encouraging, helping me to grow and achieve my full potential. As an example with collaborations we've done in the past, we've joined three of our local Rotary clubs on a litter pick for World Cleanup Day 2019 where we cleaned the riverbed in Truro, thus stopping all of the plastic from entering the ocean in the first place. It was absolutely phenomenal and Rotary certainly delivered. We removed kilos and kilos of plastic from the environment. Beach Guardian aims to engage, educate and empower against plastic pollution. An example of this is when I wore my dress made out of Walker's crisp packets to my graduation in 2018. This, along with other campaigns at the time, led to Walker's introducing the very first nationwide crisp packet recycling scheme. The future is incredibly exciting for Beach Guardian and I cannot wait for all of the future collaborations with Rotary and supporting them in their new area of supporting the environment. I'm in Aberystwyth and we've had a successful beach clean this morning. Plastic is becoming the scourge of the nation and in Rotary we are pushing to have all clubs interested in the cleanup of plastics wherever they can, whether it be beach, river, canal, waterway, whatever, so that people can see what we're doing, people of action. I saw that there was um, a clean going on today and I thought I'd come along and I, I didn't know it was anything to do with the Rotary Club but I'm always looking for opportunity to help clean up the environment in any way I can. Today has been about getting Rotarians from all up and down the coast to come and help here so it's been wonderful to see so many members here. The success I've seen so far is being told off by parents who say we can't even get on the beach now without the kids doing a litter pick first. What's going on? Downsizing, completing Incredible. And just think of that times many thousands. And that's what's happening around the world in Rotary. And I'm so pleased that my money in Rotary is making all of this possible. We have a, a very special week this week uh, in a spiritual sense. And I believe that Charlotte Zietlow is gonna um, give us a bit of a reflection here. So Charlotte, are you ready for that, Charlotte? Not quite. She's finishing a mouthful of delicious food. Um, so we'll, we'll let her do that. Um, and then we'll... So uh, yeah, what I'll do is I will go ahead and do, I'll just go, the, we, we'll come back to Charlotte in a moment. 
yeah, Tracy's going to come up. Uh, birthdays this week, we have Judge Jeff Bradley, um, April 2nd, Sarah Laughlin, congratulations, April 2nd as well, Benjamin Pearson, Tina Peterson um, on April 3rd, Leanna Powell, April 3rd as well, Lynn Schwartzberg today, and Martha Wales on Sunday the 8th. So, um, All right, thank you to care for reminding us of, of that. Um, we have 18 guests today. So I would ask that we hold our applause until the end. And I'm gonna do it, the way I'm gonna introduce people is by, by their sponsor, if you will. Um, so if you would stand when I call your name so everyone can see you. Uh, first off, we have Carrie Thompson, uh, guest of Phil Amerson and Winston Shindell. Next, we have um, guest of Michael Shermis. We have Bryce Adams and Peg Stice. If you would stand, please. Great. Then we have a uh, guest of Jim Shabe, uh, Brian Worth. There we go. Excellent. Now we have a uh, guest of uh, Glenda Murray, Hillary Fleck, and Gabby Creeble. Okay. Now, all the guests of Mike Baker, please stand. <laughs> I'll go through the names and you can raise your hand. We've got, we've got Christy Howard Schultz. We've got uh, Cynthia Moriarty, Claire Froman, Daniel Froman, and we've got John Laramore, Taylor Bosch, Angie Lynn, Ben Froman, Frankie Barnfee, uh, Noah Froman, Charlie Stringer, and Carl Gretchy. All right, great turnout, Mike. You did a, you did a phenomenal job. And one last quick reminder: uh, we had. I want to just personally thank Carrie Thompson, as well as uh, Susan Sandberg and Don Griffin, who are all running for mayor candidacy. Uh, the polls did open for early voting today, so please get out and vote. Thanks so much, uh, Tracy. And I believe that Don Griffin will be with us next week or sometime soon. Um, yes, let's see. Are there any guests online? Yes, Alon, we have two guests, guests of, o of Amy Osajima, uh, Colleen Cooper, and Kelly Debicki, I hope I'm not mispronouncing either of your names, and they are both with Wander Lab. Thank you for being with us online today. So much, welcome to everybody. Thank you, yeah. Thanks. It feels like our numbers are doubled today because of all the guests. So welcome to everybody. Okay, Charlotte, let's invite Charlotte to give us her reflection. You'll do her best, okay. Well, there's a microphone coming to you right now. Natalie is gonna uh, give you the microphone. And make sure that you hold it close to your mouth and they will hear you. Charlotte, you can go ahead and start speaking and we'll get the camera going um, as you speak. Um, I, I'm, I read the New Yorker regularly and there was an article in the New Yorker recently about conversation and the, the therapeutic value of conversation of people sitting down and talk about talking together about things, nothing, not to reach a point, not to argue, just talk, just chat. And it's, it, and it, it, there, it, there is record that, that people who converse a lot are happier and more content with their lives, believe it or not. So, so that gives us a green light for talking, but we have to have something to talk about. So today I'm gonna, something to talk about is that this is an important, interesting time in, in the year, in this particular year. We, we have Easter coming up on us, the, the Christian celebration of the resurrection of Christ. The, we have Passover going on, which is the recognition of remembrance of the, the, the flight of the, Jew, of the Jews from Egypt, with Joseph and his brothers. And we have Ramadan that, that is reaching the end of the year. The the more um, the Muslim celebration of 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 the world of life, 
we have, in fact, I found out we have a Persian thing, Nuro, I think it is. It's the it's celebration of the day and the year. It's, so there are all, these are all major religious organizations that have, that, that, that are, have different goals, but they all celebrate peace and love. And I think if we could start talking about all of these, the similarities and as well as the differences of, of how people in, throughout the world have, have ways of celebrating goodness and peace and coming together, we, can, we, we might have a happier world. So let's, let's all talk. Thank you, Charlotte, and you've been a uh, you, you've been a talker in Bloomington for a while, uh, in a way that has has bonded this community together and given Bloomington so much of what it is in character. So, Charlotte, you are a gem. Thank you. Okay, Mike Baker is going to join me here at the podium for something special. Never follow Charlotte Zillow, really. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Rotarians and guests. Uh, on occasion, Rotary Clubs recognize an individual who's not a Rotarian for their contributions to their community. Last week, we recognized Sylvia McNair for her lifetime work. Today, it's my honor to recognize Tom Froman with Memorial Paul Harris Fellow. I think we have a picture of Tom up there soon. Tom, who spent his entire career providing legal justice for underrepresented Hoosiers passed away June 28th in 2022. Today is wife, Cynthia of 36 years, Cynthia Moriarty and the children, Daniel, Claire and Ben, Ben's wife, Frankie and little Noah over there with the white hat on. So Tom was born uh, February 9th, 1954 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Tom moved to Bloomington to pursue an undergraduate degree at Indiana University. After graduating top of his class in accounting, Tom was ready to set out and make some money with his accounting degree in tow. So he took a job at Rocky's Pool Hall. <clears throat> Tom was really a good player, but he wrote his first check ever to a local hustler, Paul Toddy. Sometime later, he ended up at Seward and Company. I think Fred Dunn is with us today. Uh, Fred hired Tom as a truck driver. So Tom was moving up there. He hired me, hired my wife. That's how we all got to know each other. Finding one's way in life can take an interesting turn uh, for all of us. This is where I first met Tom. He was quick with humor, dangerous with the cue stick, loved doing math in his head, always challenged us to do square root quizzes. The square root of this, and he would do it in his head and we would always lose. Uh, rarely a day at work went by without all of us on our knees with just tears of joy of something that Tom had said or done. He was quite the prankster. Um, you could tell he was sort of one of a kind. Even during our annual dreaded inventories, maybe Fred may not want to hear this, uh, he showed us a way to count bulk items. We used to count one, two, thousands of these things. Tom, with his math, would grab a handful, put it on a scale, weigh the whole thing and say, that's close enough. So, sorry, Fred. Inventory might have been off a little bit occasionally, but, but we had fun. Uh, close enough was what he would always say. Well, as a truck driver, he delivered over sort of the central part of Indiana for Seward and Company. During his uh, stops, he met a lot of people, working class Hoosiers that were having problems in their lives, denied justice due to their low income and inability to hire competent counsel. This led Tom back to IU to earn a law degree in 1983. Tom served as an attorney for Indiana Legal Services for 38 years with distinction, integrity, dedication to helping others in need. Indiana Legal Services is a nonprofit law firm that provides free legal services and assistance to eligible low income residents throughout the state of Indiana. I believe the office here in Bloomington handles about 14 counties, if that's, if that's uh, correct. So Tom dedicated his life to helping people navigate social services, problems with eviction, child support, child custody, reinstalling a person's driver's license so they could get a job and then rebuild their lives. He told me one time he thought he was the state's leading expert on getting people's driver's license reinstated. 
So he was a managing attorney of legal services here in Bloomington from 2018 to 21. He had served as a law clerk for Honorable William Garland at the Indiana Court of Appeals, which I think helped Tom deal with some things later with the court. During his career, he helped change the laws that, uh, about child custody support payments, the way courts and judges created, uh, treated clients who were with low income and had been underrepresented in their cases. He was not afraid to file ethics complaints against attorneys or judges who use racial slurs or other unprofessional language directed towards his clients. And he won and changed some of the laws in the state of Indiana. Did I mention he was also a card shark and held regular poker games and took some of Jim Shea's money on occasion? And Brian's, I'm sure, as well. Tom taught legal ethics uh, at IU Maurer School of Law. His community work was centered in the Congressional Congregation of Beth Shalom, where he served on the board and various committees. So, busy person. Some of us, uh, spend in Rotary, spend our hours uh, during the year doing good work, trying to improve things in our community. But Tom, it was his full-time work. It was his life's work. It's difficult to really express the impact Tom had on people's lives across 14 counties of Southern Indiana. I certainly can't begin to express what it meant to these people, but I'm gonna pick something from a letter that a, a lady wrote Tom. I'm not sure you understand the difference you make in some of our lives. You were the first person to show us that some people would give us a chance and help us be normal again and treat us like humans. You gave us hope. You brought that fight back to us to succeed. I'm not sure I would have made it without hope. If you need anything at all, I mean it, anything, please let me know and I will be there. I will be there anytime. So with that, I'd like to have Claire, Ben, Dan, Claire come up to receive our recognition uh, as Tom becoming a Paul Harris Fellow. So Rotarians and guests, would you please rise and celebrate Tom Froman as our newest Paul Harris Fellow. Thanks so much, Mike. What a wonderful celebration. That's really just amazing. Well, and oh, we have another guest with us and this Wilson Shitande has joined us. So it's very nice to see Wilson. Welcome, welcome. Um, yeah. Well, just a few quick club updates before we move on to our program. Um, Sally Gaskell, I don't know, Sally, are you here? Sally wasn't able to make it. Okay, well, there- I am here. For those of you who are not reading your email, I guess I'm saying to you, please open the emails that you receive from me, because there's a lot of information that I'm not able to deliver to you from the podium, one of which will be about the book club. Um, and so Sally will give me information. I'll share that with you just as quickly as possible. She can share. Oh, yeah. she's, oh good. Sally's online. Yes. She's online. She's online. Good. Hey there. Just, hey there. A, just a victim of, just a victim of um, uh, bad parking. So, um, Two weeks and one day from now, we'll be celebrating the writings of that talker of our club, Charlotte Zitlow, at the book club, reading Charlotte's most recent book, How We Won. And everyone's invited. I would like to, an RSVP because my living room is only so big, or perhaps my back, back porch if it's uh, nice out. Seven o'clock on Wednesday the 19th, Rotary Book Club. Hope to see you there. Let me know. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. Yay, yay, yay. She's, and thank you to Sally for leading this incredible project in, uh, during the year. It's so wonderful to see that we're continuing to read, which is an important thing to do. Um, lunch Buddies, first, uh, fourth quarter, I believe that there are Lunch Buddy um, printouts on your tables. So please see who the lucky person is for, for you to go and have lunch with or go out to the movies or go to the opera. There's the uh, Bernstein Candide coming up uh, uh, in a few weeks time. Don't forget the special that we have $10 to go to that one as well. 
So there's a lot that you have for the, the lunch buddies um, to, to, to look forward to. Many, many thanks to those who were involved in the Habitat Build this past weekend. I don't have the names with me, but we will share them with you sometime very soon. We were able to do it in the, in the past two weeks, which uh, consecutive Saturdays, which was really wonderful. District conference, I want to remind those of you who are still thinking of going to the conference that we have a deadline that we'd, we would love for you to meet. We would like for you to make a commitment before this coming Saturday so that we can get the early bird special price, which we are paying half of with you. So please go ahead. And we would love to see as many people there as we can. Um, Lance Everly will not be district governor next year. So let's make sure that we support him this year. Um, and just finally, I'd I want to thank everybody who's been involved in supporting those who have suffered from the storm. Uh, quite a number of communities in this area have really suffered terribly, including Steinsville, um, the um, McCormick's Creek State, State Park. I think we all heard about the tragedy there that was just absolutely awful. Sullivan in Hel Hamilton County was also very hard hit. Phil Eskew grew up there, right? And so he knows that community very well. So look out for more information from us and from Lance about how we might be able to step forward as a club and really help with anything that communities need. With that, um, I think we should just go ahead and introduce our guest and enjoy the program. So I'm gonna invite Michael Shermas to the podium. Thanks, Lon. Um, before I introduce, I just wanna mention uh, that the city of Bloomington is uh, honoring uh, Martin Luther King for Remembrance Week. We've turned it into a week and there's a book conversation, a, a, a film, um, and we're having community walks um, around uh, the near west side where there's historical uh, African-American communities were uh, going up. And uh, all that information is online at bloomington.in.gov slash MLK. And you can find out where to go to all of those uh, events. I just want to throw that in there. Um, with that, um, it uh, was uh, a little more than a year ago today where somebody said, you know, there's a big eclipse coming next year. And, uh, it, you know, it's big. And you should have Katie Pelachowski come talk about it. So a year later, we made it happen. Um, Katie Pilotowski has been uh, excited about astronomy since she was a child. Um, after, oops, sorry, after graduating um, with a bachelor's degree in physics from Harvey Mudd College in California, she attended graduate school at the University of Hawaii, um, attracted not only not by the peaches, but by the opportunity to use the magnificent telescopes on Mount uh, Mauna Kea to learn about the universe. She worked at the National Observatory in Tucson for 20 years before joining the IU faculty in 2001 as the Daniel Kirkwood Chair of Astronomy. She is currently a distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Astronomy. She studies the chemical evolution of stars and stellar populations, specifically how and why the compositions of different populations of stars differ from each other. She especially enjoys sharing the excitement of astronomy with students and the public. Colleagues say that she is a really good teacher, nurturing, organized, positive, energetic, and thoughtful. I think we're in for a treat for her to take us to the stars. Okay. All right, so I'm normally a wanderer when I give a talk. Let me make sure I can do this correctly. Is that the right button? There we go. And I need to set it up or is somebody gonna do it? There we go. Okay, so Eclipse Mania. We are in for something in a few days from now. Um, these posters were all taken in 2007, or made up in 2017 to celebrate the eclipse that year. Uh, I hope many of you got to see the total phase of it. Here in Bloomington, we were just partial. About 94% of the sun was blocked by the moon, but in 2024, April 8th, we are on the path of totality. And judging from what we saw in 2017, it's going to be amazing not just the eclipse itself, but the impact on this community. Um, I guess I should start this one, yes. So I wanna start with the usual warning that has to accompany everything everybody ever says about the eclipse, is don't look at the sun, just don't. Um, during the total phase, when the moon completely covers the sun, absolutely look, it is a life-changing experience. Everyone who's been to a total eclipse has seen this happen will say, I'm never gonna be the same again. But the partial phases, it's still the sun, still don't look at it. So before and after totality, you need eye protection. And I have some examples here, I'll show them to you later of various things. Um, but 
There are a lot of ways to enjoy this eclipse, and we'll talk about some of those as we go through this. The date, April 8th, 2024, um, it will begin a little after, uh, a little before two o'clock, partial phase. The moon will begin to cover the sun by 304 plus uh, minus 305 minus a little bit. It's going to get dark. Total eclipse of the sun. That will last a little over four minutes. And then the sun will reappear, the moon will move off, and we'll begin to get daylight again in, in Bloomington. So four minutes of totality, it will be dark. And the phases before and after will also be pretty exciting to watch. I sketched some lines here across the, the uh, silhouette of the state. I left out the corner. I apologize for that. Uh, the heavy line in the middle is uh, the region of totality where the, the uh, period of totality will be longest. The further you are away from that line, the less to total, it, the shorter period of totality will be. So you want to be close to the center of that line. And that line passes between here and Ellettsville. So we are almost at the center of totality for this eclipse. It's a remarkable place to be, uh, but definitely in that region somewhere. And then by 422 plus a little bit, it'll all be over. What happened in 2017 is everybody arrived at a different time before the eclipse. Traffic was great. The eclipse happened, everybody went home. So plan on, if you have guests, have them stay a little while. It won't take them any longer to get home if they hang out here before they get on the road. Just a word of the why. So what happens during a total eclipse? It comes in phases. Um, the first, we define them as contact, first, second, third, fourth contact, as the moon begins to move across the sun. Um, at first contact, we see the, just the littlest sliver of moon beginning to cross, covering the sun. At this point, you need your solar viewers. Clearly, again, don't look at the sun at this point, but with a solar viewer, you certainly can. Um, and this period between first contact and second contact, when the moon is completely covering the sun, seems like it lasts forever. It just takes time. Wait, wait, wait. Nope, not there yet. Keep going. It's going to happen. Uh, it just seems really to take, be patient. And then when the moon gets about halfway across, life begins to get a little more interesting. It's hard, oh, wrong button. Hardly see anything uh, until notice, noticeable effects until this happens. But as totality approaches, things begin to happen during a total eclipse. So shadows get sharper. And that's because we're not seeing the whole disk of the sun producing the shadow, just a sliver of it. So we see changes in the shadows. Temperature begins to cool a little bit. Wind might pick up, might change direction, might actually get a little foggy. In some cases, that's what happens. Clouds on the western horizon will begin, actually in this case, the southwestern horizon, will begin to get dark. That's the exciting point. You really begin to feel like something is happening. And if you look closely at the ground, you might see an instant effect called the uh, uh, shadow band. Let me switch to the next one and show what some of this is like. When I say the shadows are going to get sharper, here's an example. Again, because the full disk of the sun is what makes shadows fuzzy, but when we just have a sliver, we get very different appearance of shadows, things to watch for during this uh, uh, late total or uh, late partial phase of the eclipse. Uh, now, you've been out to look at the trees today. We don't yet have a lot of leaves. I'm not sure how many leaves we're going to have by April 8th next year. But if we have a lot of leaves, you'll see an effect like this. So what happens is, as the light comes through the trees, the over intersecting leaves act as pinhole cameras and produce images of the sun on the ground. So if we have leaves, we'll see shadows like this, uh, basically little images of the sun as the, as the eclipse proceeds. So let's hope for leaves soon. We have a few more days before April 8th, we'll see. I don't know what next year is gonna be like, but these are one of the most interesting things to see in these late partial or just after total effects um, on the ground. The light gets kind of weird. I can't show this in a photograph because it doesn't actually photograph very well. But when we have just a crescent of sunlight, the light changes character compared to when we have full sunlight. So the colors look more saturated, shadows get very, very sharp, and the contrast of things seems to be boosted. Really tough to, to catch with a camera, but let me describe sort of what's happening. So when we look at the disk of the sun, of course you would never do that, but I have a great picture here. Um, the sun is actually different in the middle compared to the edges. And that's because in the middle of the sun, we're looking at light coming from the, the bright layers of the sun straight through the sun's atmosphere. 
that when we look around the edges of the sun, that light has to pass through more sun atmosphere on its way to the earth. And that effect causes a sort of dimming and a, an effect of sort of cooler, cooler position of where the light is coming from, from the sun. Cooler position means the light is redder. We don't get as much blue light, we get more red light coming from the sun. So the temperature of effective temperature of the sunlight looks different. And that's what leads to this eerie effect of light that you just have to see to believe. It looks weird. The light is just wrong right before totality and right after totality. Um, another thing to watch for during close approach to total phase are the shadow bands. So this is the result of small changes in the air above us. So we have turbulence in the atmosphere. There are little blobs of different temperature air that pass overhead all the time. As the crescent of sunlight passes through these changing blobs of air of different temperature, we get little kind of bending effects on the light itself. And that leads to these funny shadow bands that can be seen on the ground or the sides of buildings or perhaps on a lake surface. If you look closely at this image, you'll see sort of, and I don't think I have a cursor. Can you, you probably can't see. Oh, yes, you can. So, I didn't, oh, I'm going to do this another way. Um, sort of diagonal, I'm crooked here. But diagonally across, you see these sort of darker, slightly darker regions. The contrast is very, very low, also very difficult to photograph, but something to watch for in the last few seconds before totality occurs. Um, poster board, white sheet, whatever you can lay out on the ground will make it more easily, easier to see these. And the sort of frequency of these shadow bands passing increases as um, totality gets closer and closer to us. So interesting things to watch. Okay, so totality begins, a moment everybody's been waiting for. A couple of things to watch for right at the beginning of the total phase. First of all, we have Bailey's D. Nice, a nice explanation for this, or nice name for this, but the explanation is very simple. The limb of the moon, the very edge of the moon is not round, perfectly round. There are mountains and valleys on the moon. And so the totality sort of appears a little bit different in different places along the edge of the moon. Some places where the moon is low in altitude, we see a little more sunlight. Where there's a mountain, we see a little less sunlight. And so we see these effects of little bright spots right at the instant when totality begins. We also can see what's called the diamond ring effect, sort of the last little bit of the moon um, uh, not the last little bit of the sun that remains, we see a very bright spot often surrounded by what looks like a ring of light from the last bits of the edges of the sun that, that haven't yet been covered. So both of these things are stuff to watch for as totality approaches, finally we get that moment of totality. So during totality, it's that moment of awestruck, right? The world is different, the world has changed. All of a sudden it's dark in the daytime. But there are things to look for on the sun as well. Uh, one of them is the sun's chromosphere. This is the layer of the sun's atmosphere that is just above the layer that we see. There's a, a very strange effect on the temperature of the gas above the sun. It gets very much hotter immediately above the sun's atmosphere. This is because of magnetic effects that transfer energy outward on the sun. But we see emission of hydrogen gas it's been ionized and uh, lost its electron and then the electron reattaches and emits a particular beautiful bright red color. We see that in these, in these uh, prominences and flares that might occur above the limb of the sun and be beyond what the shadow of the moon will cover. And so watch for these sort of red uh, structures that we see around the outside of the sun uh, during an eclipse. We don't see them during Normal times, um, astronomers can see them by looking at through special filters. I'll come back to that in a minute. But in, in normal light, the sun is just too bright to allow us to see these. Uh, but they're fun to see during a total eclipse. The other thing that happens is that we can begin to see the corona of the sun. And this is the sun's most extended atmosphere that surrounds it basically in all directions. The corona is very hot gas. It has temperatures up to about 2 million degrees. So extremely hot compared to the normal part of the sun that we can see. And we can only see it during an eclipse from the surface of the earth. Astronomers have, again, special techniques that make it sort of possible, but right, not, not right up near the very edge of the sun, like we can see during a total solar eclipse. This is very hot gas that is streaming away from the sun out into the solar system and beyond. 
And this hot gas glows uh, in a variety of different, different colors. Um, and we are, in 2024, are in a great position to see the corona of the sun. We have what is well known as the sunspot cycle on the sun, that there's an 11 year cycle of activity on the solar surface. And that activity also affects the solar corona, its extension, how big and bright it is. When we're at sunspot minimum, we have the fewest number of sunspots. We don't have very much corona. Uh, when the corona is, when the sunspots are very active, we have a lot of corona. And in 2024, we should have a very large amount of corona visible in the sun. So here I've, I've pulled a chart of the number of sunspots that have been visible since about 2011. And you can see it follows a cycle. This is an 11 year cycle uh, that is driven by convective currents inside the sun and the, the dissipation and formation of the solar magnetic field and a whole bunch of details that you don't wanna know about. But by 2024, we will be just about at the point of solar maximum. And so we should have a glorious corona to observe um, for, uh, during the eclipse, all, you know, all depending on clear weather. Um, the last uh, uh, solar maximum was around 2014, 2015. It was pretty weak. Your predictions for 2025 will be having a fairly low uh, activity during sunspot maximum, but it's looking better. So I think we're going to have a good time, uh, assuming we can see the corona during the eclipse. Okay, another thing to watch for. During this eclipse, all five of the classic naked eye planets will be up in the sky lined up with the sun. So we'll have uh, Jupiter, Mercury, uh, Sun, Venus, Saturn, and Mars, all visible, not quite all, but four of the five visible in the sky. Mercury will not be visible because we'll be looking at its dark side, the side that's facing away from the sun. But the other four, will, it'll be there. If you have the right equipment, you'd probably be able to see it. But the other four will be definitely visible, lined up across the sky uh, during the eclipse. So fun to watch and see all those planets during the daytime. Where exactly will they be in their orbits? I've pulled an ephemeris here to show you where the planets are. So those inner circles, the little teeny one in the middle is Mercury, and then Venus, Earth, the orange one is Mars, and then Jupiter and Saturn. So looking exactly where the Earth is, it's the white dot that's sort of about the 530 position, looking in toward the sun, um, you can see that Mercury is is just sort of almost between us and the sun. Venus is on the far side of the sun. So we see it's well lit phase. So it will be bright in the sky. Uh, Mars is on the morning side of the sun. So below the sun on the horizon, as is Saturn and Jupiter will be on the, will be above the sun in the sky at that time. And it just has to do with where the planets are in their orbits as they, as they circle around, around the sun. So it should be fun to see all of that in the sky. Uh, when you get tired of looking at the corona and the chromosphere, looking around at the weird universe around you, the nature, um, take a look for the planets and see if you can find them all. If it's cloudy, okay, not good. Uh, there's a 40% chance we'll have sunshine and a 60% chance it's going to be cloudy on April 8th in 2024. But there are things to watch for, just, just be prepared. Um, what I'm gonna be watching for, if it's cloudy, of course, is the horizon. So watching the eclipse approach from the Southwest, watching the Southwestern horizon get darker and darker and darker, and then watching it get dark here, watching it get brighter on the Southwest horizon and darker again on the Northeastern horizon as totality passes by. All good things to watch for. Um, I don't know if Bloomington is going to allow this, but the parking garages or any place you have a good view of the horizon is a, if it's cloudy, that's where you probably wanna be someplace where you can really see the horizon all around. Um, you can look for a 360 degree sunset. Now the width of the path of totality is gonna be a couple of hundred miles plus, plus or minus. And so we're really right in the middle. It's gonna get dark, but around the horizon, we will see a little bit of a glow. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, again, cloudy, cloudy times, you definitely wanna watch for this. But even four minutes is a long time. Even during totality, if it's clear, take a look around at the horizon just to see this kind of unusual horizon appearance um, as, as the eclipse passes overhead. Nature, lots of interesting things happening in nature. Uh, flowers, some of them will open, some of them will close. Birds, different species will do different things. 
So keep an eye out for birds in your immediate vicinity. And what, what do they do? Insects, many of them will stop work. I've heard tell ants just stop in their tracks and wait it out. Spiders, some of them build their nests or build their webs. Some of them take them down. So if you happen to notice a spider web nearby, keep an eye, what, what's it going to do? And I heard from Notre Dame in the last eclipse that the squirrels went crazy. Here's a quote from the student uh, paper. St squirrel said, it was pretty terrifying. Right? <laughs> Nobody told them. And the paper reported that 80% of the squirrels on the Notre Dame campus went blind because they looked at the sun. Don't do that. Um, I should add in the 2017 eclipse, there were, I think, 48 cases of eye damage in the US from the eclipse. Now that's a remarkably small number. It's a sad number. Uh, the good news is most of those individuals improved their vision afterward, but they definitely had retinal damage from looking at the sun. And I don't want to be too, you know, sexist here, but the majority of those cases were young men. Just saying. So pay attention to the squirrels. Make sure they know that the uh, eclipse will end. Okay, so what do you all need to do? What do I need to do? What does everybody need to do to prepare for this eclipse? Be advised, in 2017, communities along the path saw their populations triple. That's pretty scary. Think public safety, emergency, cell phone use, restrooms, uh, food access, parking, traffic, all of those things will hit Bloomington. We are a popular place to come to watch an eclipse. Um, state parks are popular. All parks will be popular. Parking lots will be popular. Um, how do we begin to think about six football games coming to Bloomington on one afternoon in April? It's a pretty scary thought. Uh, from the Bloomington perspective, I think we have three communities we want to serve. I'm obviously interested in serving the campus community. How do we deal with our students and our faculty and the community members who will come and visitors who will come on our campus? How do we provide programming and viewing spots and information to help everyone enjoy this eclipse? Bloomington families are an important constituency that we have to think about. MCCSC is not holding classes this day. Kids will not be in school. And that's gonna have impact on our workforce and on families and on kids that we need to prepare them in advance to be able to enjoy and understand this eclipse safely. And visitors, if we have, that'll be the majority of the people in town on that day, but finding programs to assist our visitors to enjoy Bloomington, to find out what's going on in Bloomington, to be here a little bit longer, to hold them after the eclipse, to avoid the parking lot on I-69. All of those things we have to think about as this next year unfolds. So for IU, we're looking to build on the activities that we had in 2017 for the partial eclipse. Uh, that is things to do on campus, events happening to hold people to help them enjoy this day. Uh, just focusing on a variety of activities. What can we do for students, faculty, and community members who come to enjoy our campus on the eclipse day? For astronomy, what we'd like to do is live stream the eclipse, the total start to finish from Kirkwood Observatory. We have a solar telescope in the observatory um, you may notice that many of you uh, be, uh, in the front of the dome on this little picture, there's kind of a little Q-tip up there. That is a, a, what we call a heliostat. It's a mirror that reflects light down through a hole in the roof into uh, the room below. And in that room, we have this, this contraption of, of prisms and mirrors and lenses that produces images of the sun. And we are gearing up to use those images to live stream the eclipse so people can everywhere can see totality from Bloomington. I can assure you we're hoping it's clear, no guarantees, but it's what we're gonna see. We hope to be able to show the world the, the chromosphere certainly, and we hope also um, a corona around the sun during the total eclipse. So we're really trying to gear up to do that. And I wanna to point to Bryce on his shoulders. So good luck. <laughs> it's gonna be fantastic. We're really excited about, about sharing this. With the community. Um, the community is really where I, I worry the most. We hope to provide for the community training workshops 
to train the trainers that we can't reach out to we the astronomy department we're a small little group of people we can't reach out to everybody in bloomington every visitor that we're going to have but what we'd like to do is hold workshops to help people in the community train others in the community uh, help teachers help community um, organizations help boys and girls clubs help uh, wonder lab help everybody prepare to uh, be able to share this eclipse and to train a much larger group of people. We want families to be prepared. And that means training people who can train families all through Bloomington to be prepared for this, this particular event in the sky. Um, so no time to waste. Our goal is to coordinate and share outreach and education activities to make sure everybody can enjoy this eclipse safely. We formed a small group, it's growing, of uh, outreach groups in the community um, college departments on campus, community organizations to sort of help us help each other prepare for this great eclipse. Okay, so what, how would we do this? And here I have my to think about that everybody should be prepared with. I'm going to start with the basic eclipse viewer. Everybody should have one of these. Actually, you can share them. Nobody wants to look at four or three and a half hours of partial eclipse. So you don't need one for everybody, but you know, pass them around. That's really helpful. They also come in the form of glasses. Uh, I like the viewers better. I think they're a little bit safer just because if I'm wearing the glasses and I decide to take a step over, I can't see what's going on next to me. So I'd rather have a viewer that I can easily remove. Plus the pupil spacing on these is way too big for me. Forget those. Um, a higher end, a pair of solar binoculars. You can use these any time to actually look at the sun. You can't see anything else. I can pass these around. You won't see anything through them, but they're kind of handy. Um, and finally, if you have <laughs> if you have a small telescope, get one of these things. It's a solar filter. This one is a 70 millimeter. It's about 20 bucks. Easy to purchase, easy to add to a telescope. And that makes it possible to use the telescope during the eclipse. They're not expensive and they're um, very easy to come by. And lastly, I want to show a shoebox viewer. This is super easy to make. Um, I want to show you, first of all, on this end of the box, it's a square and a dark, uh, something okay. It could be tinfoil, it could be just about anything. There's a little teeny hole poked in the middle of it. And that forms a pinhole image on the white card in the back. So we see a picture, we can actually produce an image of the sun. And on the side, there's a little cutout, so I can point that at the sun, look through the little hole, and see the, the sun on the white side. So super easy to use, super easy to make. Everybody's got a cereal box or a shoe box um, that it's easy to make a viewer like this to see the eclipse. So I think I'm done. Let me see what else I got. Ah, I wanted to give a plug for the Center for Rural Engagement. So yay, Center for Rural Engagement. They are working with counties all, all around us, communities all around us to help them prepare also for the eclipse. And this is so important for, for not just Bloomington, but all of the communities in Southern Indiana. So thank you so much, Terry, for, for doing that. Um, finally, uh, what can you do? I can assure you that every organization in this town is going to need your help. They need volunteers, before the eclipse to help prepare the community, to train families, uh, help us host workshops, welcome visitors on the day of the eclipse, volunteers in parks and other venues where people will be watching the eclipse. That keeps me up at night, making sure we have the community resources to really help everybody enjoy this eclipse. That literally is what I, what I do every night. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, resources. I can't give you a recommendation on where to buy viewers. But I can tell you what I buy them. Okay. I go to Thousand Oaks Optical or Rainbow Symphony. Both have viewers that cost, if you buy in quantity, less than about 45 cents a piece. So buy viewers, get them for your family, get them for community organizations, make those viewers available as widely as we can. If you want, if you're trying to promote activities, there are royalty free images available at eclipse.aas.org. I recommend that site for getting images for the eclipse. And there's a book uh, that summarized the uh, lessons learned from the 2017 eclipse along the path. This is published by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. 
it's one of their conference series books, and it's the one I go to to look for information about what communities did, what worked, and what didn't. So I recommend this book. And the IU Library has a copy available, uh, ebook available, so it can be uh, seen easily from there. And I'll stop there. I think that's the last. Ah, don't miss it. It's um, the best you'll ever have. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. That was absolutely amazing. That was uh, extraordinary. Um, so we have a few things to do. Uh, Wonder Lab, talking about Wonder Lab and glasses. I like glasses. I'm sorry to say, Katie, I actually I like glasses. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that there are actually secretly, Amy Osajima, thanks to Wonder Lab, has put one set of glasses, eclipse glasses, under one of the seats at all tables. So one of you is the lucky recipient of an eclipse glass. Let's see who those people are. Anybody got them? Anybody see them under your under your seat? Have a look under your seat. Hopefully we're not going to damage any backs or anything like that. <laughs> Nothing? No? Amy, where are the glasses? Under the front of your seat. Oh, uh, there we go. We've got Jeff Richardson has a glass. Set of glasses. Jeff Richardson found his glasses. Dakir has his glasses. Good. Dakir. Yay. Dakir for the whole family. Who else? Michael Shermis has glasses. There we go. Here we go. Well done, everybody. Okay. Okay. So the second thing that we're going to do, okay, very stylish, very stylish, very cool. I need, I need to take a picture of that, yes. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is, we, in, in thanks to Katie, we have to choose the, the local agency that we support for the final quarter of the year. And we're going to ask Katie to put her hand in here and jiggle it around as much as possible so that we are as fair as we can, and then pick out only one piece of paper. Only one piece of paper. And then the, the recipient is HealthNet, which was Volunteers in Medicine. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, so Raj Hadawi, you should be very pleased to hear that. HealthNet is receiving our support. Okay, good. Um, any questions? I think we do have like a minute for any questions. For Katie, if you want to start here, if anybody has a question for you or anybody online. Yes, you can get a copy of the presentation, yes. Okay, that oh, sounds good. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the question from the podium here. So, yes. The 40% possibility of a clean day based on historical experience, is that right? Yes, it's based on historical record for the last 20 years. Another question from the left here. So where will you be to watch the eclipse? <laughs> Where will I be? It depends on the weather. So if it's cloudy, I will probably be on, if I can get away from everything else I have to do, I will probably be on the roof of the Fest parking lot, Henderson parking garage. Um, just because I know there's a great view of the horizon from way up there. And that's really what I want to, if it's cloudy, that's what I want to be able to see. However, if I were a real nature lover, I would want to be where there are birds and squirrels and spiders and ants, where I could sort of watch what happens during the daytime as it gets dark. So it really depends on where you want to be to, in that cloudy weather. Um, in terms of, of just clear weather, anywhere you have a wide open view is great. The sun will be up at about a 54 degree angle, just west of south. So it's going to be high. It doesn't matter where you are. Uh, anywhere will be fine to see the, the sky. You don't have to be anywhere special. Um, it's not like you have to hide or, or you know, go to any, any usual place. So any place that you can be will work just fine to see this eclipse. Mm -hmm. And Katie, I've, I've been thinking about your last name all the way through this meeting, Kolachowski, is that right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful name, absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, next week we'll be we'll be meeting upstairs in the east the state room east so it's like here but it's one step one one floor up we will welcome um, Sankalp Sharma who some of you know as this extraordinary student at Indiana University 
who has run People of IU, the project People of IU. Jim Bright and I were at the, um, what's that? These are his pictures. You're absolutely right. These are his pictures. So you're welcome to come and have a look at them. Jim and I, uh, Jim Bright and I were at a fantastic reception evening banquet for a number of people of IU people last Saturday. And he's agreed to come in. He was here with his family last week and he was introduced to us last week. So we're looking forward to him. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and just share the four way plus one test and celebrate a beautiful day. Um, of the things we think, say, or do, first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, is it fun? Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here.